I'm Dana Resup. I'm one of the emergency medicine ultrasound attendings. I'm here to talk to you about some pertinent positives of ultrasound. We're going to start with some resuscitative scans. So we'll cover aorta, the extended fast with lung and abdominal views, as well as cardiac and deep venous thrombosis ultrasounds. When you're scanning in the department, most of the patients that you see have normal findings. So this is a chance to see all the abnormals that you're looking for when you're looking at your ultrasound. And I'll talk about some clinical situations as we go through them. Let's start with aorta. A couple important points about the aorta scan. One of them is that you wanna make sure that you're looking for the landmark, which is the spinal stripe. So the aorta sits on top of the spine. You should always make sure you see the spine in the background because otherwise you're just looking at a circle and there's lots of circles in the abdomen. The next thing to be careful of is to make sure that you're measuring outside to outside if you do see an abnormal aorta. We'll talk about why that's important as we go through, but top to bottom, outside to outside. And last, the most important thing to know about abdominal aortic aneurysms is most of them are in the lower or the distal portion of the aorta in the infrarenal portion. So that's distal to the big branches that we typically look for. So just make sure you're scanning all the way down. This is a normal aorta, so we're going to start off simple. Up here, this is a sagittal view, so this is up towards the patient's head. Down here is where the patient's feet are. This is the spine behind it, so lumbar body, lumbar body, right here. And then above it, you see that aorta is there a little bit off axis, and so you can see proximal aorta moving down to the distal aorta. Two branches here, so the first uh, proximal branch is going to be the celiac, and the next branch is going to be that SMA. If you look at these in short axis, you can see why the SMA is so much easier to find than the celiac. It really runs along the top of the aorta for a while. And so if you have bowel gas up here, you may block that celiac, but eventually that SMA will come out of the bowel gas so you can see it. Here's another aorta and sagittal view. So once again, this is up towards the patient's head. This is aorta. You can tell it's not going into the heart, so it's not the IVC or the inferior vena cava. As they slide down, they just slide right on over this bowel gas and skip it because you can't see there anyways. And then here in this distal portion of the aorta, right before the bifurcation is this large area. This aorta right here is probably about a little over four centimeters. So a little bit enlarged, but not the biggest that we see, but it increases more than 50% of the size of the proximal aorta, which is kind of a nice rule of thumb. If you want to just glance at the screen and notice if something's abnormal, it shouldn't be getting bigger as you go down in distal on the patient's abdomen. It should be getting smaller. This is another sagittal view, but it's harder to tell that it's sagittal, and you'll see why when we switch to the transverse view. But for right now, this is the spinal stripe right here, and you can see there's lots of aorta, there's lots of atherosclerosis on the inside of this artery. There's a, this, this hyperechoic tissue right here, a little bit of shadowing, and then there's a little bit of mural thrombus that we're starting to see here. Let's rotate the probe. And now we're looking at that same aorta in transverse view or coronal view. And so right here, we're looking at why it looks so funny in the long axis view. And that's because they're looking at just the lumen of the aorta, which means they're just looking at this side of it. So they're, we're looking here and not actually seeing the extent of the size of the aneurysm, which is actually filled with mural thrombus and is right here. This is one of the reasons why in point of care ultrasound, we measure these aortic aneurysms in short axis or transverse, because we want to make sure that this is as, we want to overestimate and be as sensitive as possible um, versus radiology. It's important for them to be accurate so that they can see if these are changing over time. So they actually measure in sagittal view or long axis. But our, it's not important to us whether or not we are seeing a tiny change over time in that aorta, it's more important that we just diagnose that aneurysm and then move from there. Here's another aortic aneurysm. This one is about six to almost seven centimeters in spots. They're going to measure from the outside all the way down to here. A little bit further they would have gotten down to here, that's seven centimeters. Here's that spinal stripe we talked about, that's the landmark. And then this aorta has one other finding at the very beginning of this clip is this little area right here that's a little bit of a dissection flap on the side of the wall. So you want to be on the lookout for those. Ultrasound is not sensitive, but is specific for dissections. Here's an even more prominent dissection. This aorta sitting right here is just a little bit outside of the range of normal, so a little enlarged. Bright hyperechoic wall here in the middle of the aorta with the false lumen here and the true lumen up here. This is the IVC. 
and both of these are sitting on the back of the spine. So this is that spinal stripe. A patient like this, sometimes I refer to this as the spinal horseshoe because it's less of a stripe and more of a semicircle. This is the spine on this one. So here's the patient's spine and above here is the aorta. We don't really see the IVC, it's pretty collapsed in this picture, but this aorta has a little line right here. Do you think that is an artifact or do you think it's real? Is that actually a dissection that we're catching? Many people will say that if I've asked the question, the odds are pretty good that it's not real. And you are correct in that. You're good at your test taking skills. So this right here, if you look at this line, it kind of crosses across the wall of the aorta. If you look at it over here, it kind of crosses over here. We can see it here. This is an artifact. It's a reflection. So the sound waves come out of the probe, hit this posterior wall of this rectus sheath muscle. It's very, very bright fascia. Hits that hyperechoic fascia, bounces back up like it's supposed to. The ultrasound machine listens to those sound waves and puts a line here. But some of those sound waves actually bounce back again, bounce up again, and the machine says, okay, there's another line right here. And there's actually another line right down here. So you get this repetitive pattern of artifact um, hyperechoic lines here that usually we just lose in the gray and the chaos of all the other tissues here. But when you have it overline a, an anechoic area like this, it shows up bright and clear and we have to find a way to figure out if this is real or if it's an artifact. Things you can do is move the probe over so you're ultrasounding not through this rectus sheath muscle. You can rotate the probe, sometimes seen in a different plane, just makes this artifact act a little bit differently. Although it'd be challenging with this one since this rectus sheath muscle also runs along the sagittal plane. And then the other thing you can do is gonna be shown in just one second. Here's another aorta. This is down near the iliac bifurcation. There's a little line on this one too. See that one? Bright little line right there couple things that make you think that this might be more real than fake. One of them is that it doesn't seem to cross over the wall of the sides of the aorta. And the other thing is it's occurring right at this iliac bifurcation, which is an area where that wall has a tendency to be a little bit more weak, a little bit more prone to dissection. And the last one is the last thing you can do to help you out with these artifacts. And that is the provider who was doing this ultrasound put color Doppler on it and found that this is the true lumen because it lights up the brightest and the most, and the most um, consistently. And then down here is that false lumen. So sometimes we get a little bit of artifact and a little bit of flow in here, but most of it's in this anterior side. Here's another funny one. This also kind of looks like a dissection because there's little lines inside a bigger line, but this is actually an aorta that has been repaired. So this is a patient who's had an endovascular repair. So in this patient, their aorta, their aneurysm was distal, just like they usually are. And this is the uh, this is the proximal edge of the graft. And then it has two little pants that go, eventually will get into the iliacs. But right we're here, we're just seeing those two pant legs going through the native aorta, which is big and dilated. This patient needs to have consistent monitoring over time every six to 12 months to evaluate this outer native aorta to make sure that it's not getting bigger. If it's getting bigger, that indicates that the endograft leak has gotten too big and that that patient needs to be reevaluated for possible more possible new procedures. There is some amount of endograft leak that's allowed, which is why if you look on the outside of this, this doesn't look, this looks like these little circles, the iliac vessels here are actually floating in fluid is because there is some allow, some allowed blood flow out of the graft. This is a patient who was, was an emergency department patient that I took over her care when I came on for an overnight. This is actually the provider who signed out to me their ultrasound. And he said, wow, look at this. And I said, yes, wow, look at that. He was the, the provider was there for a while and helped me resuscitate this patient after they ruptured the rest of the way and required blood products and were eventually um, flown out to a vascular center because we did not have access to vascular surgery. Spinal striper here big dilated aorta, but if we measured just the inside of the inside of this lumen, we would actually have gotten maybe a normal sized aorta, but the actual aortic aneurysm is from outside to outside, and, and this patient was about seven centimeters. This is another patient who was actually diagnosed by an emergency medicine resident who was just practicing scanning. He asked the attending, do you have anybody who's bored? And the attending said, yeah, I've got this patient who's being admitted for chest pain and is just waiting for a bed. 
So my friend, this fellow resident, went to go ultrasound him, and this is his aorta. So this patient has a big abdominal aortic aneurysm, a dissection flap, a very well hydrated IVC, because they've been getting maintenance fluid for a few hours while they're waiting for their bed. And they also have some suspicious areas of hypoechoic, sharp cornered collections of fluid, which is probably blood accumulating around this patient's aorta in the retroperitoneum. Usually once these patients rupture into their abdomen, which is when you'd, when you'd see a positive fast, usually they are coding or very, very unstable. This patient was pretty stable because he was just waiting for a bed for his stress test. So this is probably blood along the inside of the retroperitoneum. All right, speaking of ultrasounds of abdomens with fluid, let's talk about the extended fast. So we'll start with some lung views. This is the anterior lung right here. Rib, pleural line, rib, skin, and muscle. And down here, what we're looking for is we're looking for some sliding. There's not a lot. So this is a patient who has a positive pneumothorax. Here's another patient. There's a rib here. Pleura here, rib here. Comparison to the prior, there's a lot of sliding on this one. Look at all that sliding back and forth. Lots and lots of little comet tails. This is a nice, reassuring negative pneumothorax. Here's another patient with a rib here, anterior view, rib here, pleural line here. It's kind of hard to tell. It looks like maybe they're sliding, but the provider who did it couldn't tell either. They put M mode on. They have all this chaos down here under the length of the lung line that shows the sandy beach sign right here. So there's no change in the anterior view because this muscle and the skin and the bones aren't moving. But down here, this is artifact from the lung bouncing all the sound waves all over the place. And that it gives you this sandy beach sign, which looks kind of like old TV static when there were when you got static when there was no signal. So this is the sandy beach, and this indicates an intact lung. Here's another image, skin, muscle, rib. We're sliding from one side of this rib to the other. So here's one side, no sliding. Here's this side, sliding. If you're getting worried by the anatomy, the probe is actually technically upside down, if that helps. This is a lung point. So here the lung is, a, is hitting the chest wall, and down here it's not, because this is where the pneumothorax starts, is right somewhere behind this rib. Gives you a sense as to how big this pneumothorax is. You can map it out on patients. So um, anything that makes the lungs not slide will cause lung sliding. So although the lung um, sliding was initially used and um, evidence-based use for pneumothorax, there's other things that make lungs not slide, including really dilated lungs, like um, right main stem intubation, severe ARDS, uh, pleurodesis can make the lung point disappear. Apnea can make your lung, uh, sorry, will make your lung sliding disappear. Apnea will make your lung sliding disappear because they're not moving their lung. But if you have a lung point, like we did on this slide, that will always be a pneumothorax. So if you don't have a chest x-ray to confirm and there's not a patient story that highly indicates pneumothorax, you may want to look for the lung point before you go ahead and put a chest tube in somebody or get a chest x-ray. All right, one more lung here, right side. This is the left side. L right side, left side. Patients are their own best control. Right side, left side. So the left side is intact and the right side has no sliding. The right side has a pneumothorax. All right, here is one more view of a lung so if you had that last patient, one side's not sliding, the other side's not sliding, what's going on here? This is the edge of the lung point. Last time it was hiding behind a rib. This time it's creeping up from behind that rib so we can see it in the intercostal space. All right, a little bit of deeper lung. So if you have your depth of your image is past 12 centimeters and you see these comet tails go all the way down to the bottom of the screen, then this these are called beelines. 
these bee lines can indicate some sort of inflammation or fluid around the edges of the alveoli. Basically, it means that the walls around the alveoli are thick. Usually, we use this in the context of pleural, um, like pulmonary edema, but it can be indicating something like uh, pulmonary fibrosis or pneumonias and things like that. This is A lines. This is what we expect to see. So if you get that depth nice and deep and you don't see any comet tail, see there's some lines that show up here, but they don't go all the way down to the bottom of the screen. Those are just normal lung findings and can be hyperinflated lung, like asthma, versus this over here would be fluid filled lung. All right, on to the abdomen views of the fast. So here is a spleen right here. Diaphragm, spine, here's that kidney. Right here, we see, what do you think? This is a negative ultrasound view. So no fluid around this spleen, no fluid up in the chest wall. Spine stripe, the spinal stripe is right here and it disappears right at the edge of the diaphragm. If you're looking down here, there's a little, there's some shadows here and there because of the ribs. You gotta go work around those. And then back here is psoas muscle and then the kidney on top of it. Spleen, kidney, spinal stripe. Positive or negative for free fluid? This is positive. There's a pocket of fluid at the distal tip of the spleen in the pericolic gutter. Here's another one. This is a repeat fast. This is the liver. Our depth is a little suboptimal here. We could use more depth here, but we found the finding and that is this fluid collection around the tip of the liver. You can use a repeat fast if your first fast is negative and the patient's getting worse, or in the context of having a patient who has a known abdominal injury and for whatever reason, their care is being delayed. Maybe they're a good IR candidate, but interventional radiology is busy doing something else. This can help you triage your patients because you can repeat your fast and see how much fluid they're accumulating. There's a spleen again. So back of the spleen, this is the diaphragm. Here's the spinal stripe. Don't get confused by the blood vessel that we see every once in a while back here. That just means our probe is really posterior. Look here along the spleen edge. So the tip of the spleen here, all the way around the splenal renal area. I don't see any free fluid here. This is a negative fast. Look up here in the lung. See that spinal stripe disappears. This patient breathes. They also have a negative lung exam. See how this looks all um, sort of um, spotty, just like the spleen does here. So this is a mirror artifact. So we're just seeing this organ right here reflected over the diaphragm. This is a real life picture. So the provider who's doing this ultrasound is moving around a little bit. But as we see here, here's the spleen. Here's the kidney here. We'll stop this video right on the edge. And here's this big fluid collection all along the splenal renal junction and the tip of the spleen. This is a patient who came in after he was riding his bike. He had just started. He lived on top of a hill. He was on a road bike and his road bike hit the only stone in the entire road, froze up the wheel on him and he fell into a hydrant. He said, hey doc, when can I get back on my bike? And I said, well, we'll talk about that later. So what he has is this very, very subtle finding Yep. A fluid right here at the tip. Sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button here. He has a very subtle finding of fluid right here. It's this little teeny tiny little triangle, which is not unusual for us to find in these stable patients who come in either with, you know, a pretty decent ambulatory mechanism or one low blood pressure in the field that then responds to a small bolus of fluid and doesn't recur. We'll sometimes see these small areas of blood, which can help us figure out what to do for triage. So I'm not gonna send this patient to the operating room for this little tiny amount of fluid in a stable patient, but I might try to get his CAT scan done a little bit sooner than anybody else's CAT scan. 
he ended up having a spleen laceration. He's a patient with bladder view. This is a transverse bladder view. There's no free fluid on this view. So looking down here, there's two seminal vesicles down here, which can sometimes fool people, but no free fluid anywhere else along the rest of that abdominal view. Here's another bladder view. There we go, sagittal. So here's bladder right here, prostate. Back here is a big puddle. This patient has a positive fast. Here's a heart, positive or negative. There's fluid here, that could be a fat pad, but we see that fluid wraps all the way to the back of this heart as well. So this is a positive cardiac ultrasound for free fluid. Very concerning if you have a patient with penetrating chest trauma. Here's another patient, this patient did come in stabbed. They had an upper abdomen stab wound. And this is the only view of the fast that we got, because once we had this view, we sent this patient straight to the operating room and we skipped everything else other than getting IV access. Here's another patient, right upper quadrants. This is the liver that we're seeing up here. This is gallbladder right here. We see in one area, we see a little bit of a circle around it here. So that means that this is actually all free fluid. So this is a positive fast. Don't get confused by the gallbladder. Here's another view. This is the spleen view on a different patient. Positive or negative? There's a bunch of fluid here on top of the spleen. So there's positive fast to the abdomen. There's also fluid up here in the lungs. You can see this chest, this uh, um, spinal stripe continuing up into the chest. And the little black triangle right here are pleural effusions. They have both a pleural effusion and also abdominal ascites. Spleen, kidney, and a big puddle. So here's lung sitting right here and no free fluid in the abdomen. This is all a big fluid collection in the lung with a collapsed atelectatic lung here. This is again the spleen. What do you think about the lung? There's a small pleural effusion here. So you can see that spinal strip continuing, intact lung hopping in here, but there's a fluid collection right here. As to whether or not there's free fluid in the abdomen, it's a little harder to tell. There may be a little bit of hypochoic or anechoicness right here, maybe some free fluid, but too limited to be able to call it without some further imaging or rotating that probe and really looking at that corner of the spleen. Positive or negative? It's very subtle. Positive. This is another one of those ambulatory patients comes in, seems to be doing okay. We need to get their CAT scan sooner rather than later because they have an abdominal injury somewhere. A little fluid right here, the superior pole of the kidney. This patient had blood in his urine after a car accident. He has free fluid, get that one to play again, free fluid right here at the tip of the liver and a destroyed kidney. So this is all this bright, bright stuff here is all blood in the retroperitoneum from a grade four kidney laceration. All right. Let's look at some pictures of hearts. Here's a parasternal long view of the heart. Here's the right ventricle, aorta, left atrium, and left ventricle and the descending aorta. To do this view, remember that page, the probe marker, if it's sitting here on the screen, sorry, I got cut off here. It's gonna be pointed up towards the patient's right hand shoulder. 
and the anterior chest wall. Things to notice here is that this mitral valve is giving a little high five to the septum. That means they've got pretty good ejection fraction if they can get a little high five all the way up to that septum. Descending aorta is right here. So this depth is perfect. You're just past that descending aorta. Here's another heart, right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium, and the aorta. This mitral valve is not moving as much as that last one was. Look, barely opening up enough for a new fluid to come in because there's not very much fluid going out. This is a big, dilated, sad left ventricle. Descending aorta looks pretty good. This patient came in with a lot of respiratory distress because they had fluid overload on top of chronic congestive heart failure. And an ejection fraction of 10% on their echo the next day. This is another peristernal long view, right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium. This here is the aorta and it looks very prominent. So they're gonna measure it, which I interrupted them a second ago. Measure outside to inside on the proximal aorta, and it should be less than 3.5 centimeters. So this is a dilated aorta. Right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium right here. Here's the aorta. Here's the descending aorta right here. So this patient has good cardiac motion but they have a large pericardial effusion. So this is a positive ultrasound for pericardial effusion. This patient's been accumulating this effusion for a long time. That's why it's so big. This is a large pericardial effusion. There's some strands of um, inflammation in here. You can tell that this is pericardial because it crosses over this descending aorta. This patient also has a pleural effusion. You can see the, you can just barely see the back of the thorax here. The fluid that's in the thorax will never cross over the top of this aorta. It has to stop right here because this is the back of the mediastinum. This is the spinal stripe right here. So if you see fluid over here, but not crossing over the aorta, then you know that that's thoracic. Here's another heart that's not so happy. Right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. The left ventricle is collapsed. So it looks kind of funny. This is actually a um, papillary muscle right here. Their valve is moving. This is a coding patient, so they do not have a pulse. The valve motion alone does not indicate that they have cardiac activity because valve motion alone can indicate just positive, like flow forwards from positive pressure ventilation. But if you look very carefully, there's a subtle pattern of movement along the myocardium up here and a little bit down here as well. This patient has some very subtle movement. So they do have, this is a PEA arrest with some organized cardiac activity, but they have no flow from it. So we need to give this patient more fluids or epinephrine if they have a chance of surviving and see if we can find out if there's some other reason for their PEA arrest. There's the descending aorta right here. So at least we know it's not from a proximal aortic issue. So peristernal short view. So what we're doing is we're just tilting down and up. So up towards the patient's head, we get this aortic valve. And then as we tilt back down again, we're gonna get to the mitral valve, which looks like a big fish mouth, opening up Oop, and close. This is a good view for looking at the how well the heart is contracting. It's also a good view for looking at pericardial effusions. Because if you just have a pericardial effusion on the, or if you just see hypococcus on the right ventricle, that may be a fat pad. But if it wraps all the way around the heart, like this one does, then it's a pericardial effusion. This heart's a little bit limited because there's probably a pacemaker here, which is blocking our view. We're getting too much reverberation artifact off this back wall. But we can see the left ventricle pretty well, and we can see that it doesn't have quite as much ejection fraction as we'd like. It's, I would say that's definitely less than 50% but greater than 20%. So decreased, but still doing okay. Here's another heart. This is back to peristernal short. So right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium. The aorta is kind of hard to see. It kind of comes in and out of view. There's fluid here. We know it's real because it's in the back of the heart too. It's not just a fat pad. Is this in the heart? Is this around the heart or is it in the lung? I hope you said it's around the heart because it's going over the descending aorta. So this means it's pericardial. Yep, 
Here's another view of a heart that's having a rough day. So this is a trampoline sign and a heart with a big, huge pericardial effusion around it. So right ventricle is collapsing all the way. When you see this view, it's probably tamponade because it's just popping open as that atrial kick fills it up at the last second is the only time that, a, um, that right ventricle is opening. All right, on the apical four chamber and a couple other views. So there's your apical four. This one is not quite perfect, but pretty close. So you want the septum to be up and down the middle of the screen and you want your valves to be in plane so you can see them both open at the same time. This one, we just missed that right, uh, mitral, that right tricuspid valve just a little bit, although the mitral valve looks pretty good on this side. You can see the left ventricle, which is over here, looks a little bigger than the right ventricle. And here's the atria down here. I try not to read pericardial effusions off this view very often because they're kind of hard to see. This is just lung artifact over here and over here. So there's always a little bit of darkness on the edges of these. Here is a, per a, a pericardial effusion on apical four chamber. This apical four is a little off axis, which shows us a great view of the right, of the right ventricle. The left ventricle is a little suboptimal because we're not really catching it in plane. We're catching both the aorta and the mitral valve in the, on the left ventricle side. But this right valve, right ventricle, we're seeing really well. We even see the little moderator band across it. This is a normal structure in the right ventricle, which is this little band, that muscle that goes across. And then pericardial fusion, little tiny one, just hit, sitting around, probably not causing this patient any problems. Here's a subxiphoid view. You can tell it's subxiphoid because there's a bunch of liver right here in our near field. Right ventricle sits right on top of that liver, and then the right atrium's here left ventricle and left atrium. So this is one of our four chamber views, but it's not symmetrical, so we can't compare the chamber sizes very well. Once again, we see darkness where the lungs are. Don't read this as a pericardial fusion. This is just lung artifact. Here's a patient with a subxiphoid view, liver's right here. This is a patient who'd had a heart attack um, in the last couple weeks. And they have a complex pericardial fusion with a little bit of serum in there, can kind of see a little black here and there. This patient has a rupture of their ventricle wall and they have a big blood clot on the inside of their pericardium. If you needed to buy them a little bit of time, you could stick a needle in this and suck some of this simple fluid out of here, but the blood clot will not come out through a needle. This patient needs surgery to get this evacuated and also to repair the defect of their heart. Here's another subxiphoid view. Liver's right here. Right ventricles here. Here's the right atrium. And this is actually a little bit of a suboptimal view. This is the aorta and the heart actually continues down past the edge of the screen. You always wanna have a couple of centimeters past whatever it is you're looking at. So we need more depth here. But this view is in here because the provider who did this did such a good job of capturing this pacer wire. That's what this hyperechoic line is here that has a reverberation artifact off of it. You can see these lines coming down and this kind of starburst shape that's typical of pacer wires or other wires that you'll see. All right, quiz time. This heart's a little bit funnier looking than some of them we've seen. I'll show you why. This is a parasternal long view. This is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle here, left atrium here. It looks a little funny because we're not really catching the aorta at all. Okay, and then this is the descending aorta right here. So the question for the quiz is, where is this fluid sitting over here? Is it pericardial or is it thoracic? And I hope you said it was thoracic because it does not cross over this descending aorta right here. So it has to be over in the thorax and is not part of the pericardium. All right, one more for this resuscitation section, and that's gonna be DVT ultrasound. So quick refresher in DVT ultrasound. We're gonna start way up here at the top at the inguinal ligament, where you should see an artery, the common femoral artery and the common femoral vein with the saphenous coming in medially and dumping into the common femoral vein. Once you find them, you squish them. And you want to make sure that the walls co-apt completely and collapse all of the way in order to call it negative. Then you move that probe down just a little tiny bit more 
the artery branches, the vein branches. Any branches that you see of the vein, make sure those collapse too, as well as collapsing the common femoral vein. There's lots of turbulence in this area with all these branches coming together. So you wanna be really cautious and make sure you do lots of compressions up here at this proximal portion of the leg. Once you move down to here, a little bit further down, then it's just an artery and a vein, not as much turbulence, so there's fewer isolated clots here, and you can compress just the vein. This is easy squeezy. Push, squish down, get that thing collapsed, and you can move down, squish, 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 squish. Once you get close to the knee, you can't really see these vessels anymore, so you have to move the probe from the front to the back to get them behind the tibia and the femur because those vessels wrapped around the leg. Now in the pop, the vein's on top. So now we're looking at the blood vessel to collapse at the top of the screen. So let's look at that in action. So here's saphenous, here's common femoral vein. Saphenous is collapsing, the common femoral vein is collapsing. The artery has already branched off. Sometimes that does that, sometimes it branches off super fast. So here's common femoral artery, and here's the little artery branch sitting over here. But the common femoral vein is collapsing beautifully, as is the saphenous. Move down a little bit, and they actually move right over the branches of the vein, and they just collapse the artery and the vein here. So collapse the vein, and then collapse the vein right there. They are collapsing the branch of the vein, you just can't see it. So we'll find a better picture later. This is the easy part. Artery, vein, squish. See that vein squishing all the way, it's beautiful. All right, this is a lymph node. So this blobby thing up here is a lymph node. This is an artery, this is the vein, and this over here is a branch of that femoral vein. And they're collapsing the vein pretty well. They don't quite get this branch of the vein collapsed. So there could be a clot here, or the patient may just not be tolerating it very well because they're squishing right on a lymph node and those have a tendency to be painful. But this patient needs some more evaluation of this blood vessel right here. All right, on to the popliteal. So in the vein, in the pop, the vein's on top. Make sure that squishes all the way. Get those walls nice and coapted. Look at that beautiful squish right there. Here's the artery, a little tiny bit of calcium in the artery. So you squish it all the way, make sure it's gone away. If you go a little bit distal, you'll end up with lots of different branches in here. And so they appropriately move to the top of the artery in the vein to get only two circles to squish. Here's another picture of a popliteal. So here's artery right here. Vein is here, and there's actually a branch over here. And as you notice, here's it big, and here it squishes down small. And you can actually see echoes in here. Sometimes clots are visible, sometimes they're not. In this particular patient, when we compress it, we can see this clot right here. So this is a DVT of the popliteal vein. Here's another popliteal vessel. So here's the artery right here. Here's the vein. Looks like it pops open nice and well, but if you pay attention, there's this little rim right here that doesn't quite collapse all the way. This is a patient who had a partially occlusive blood clot of the popliteal vein. So you want to make sure you're watching for those partial occlusions as well as full occlusions. Here's the common femoral vein. So we're way back up at the top of the leg. Here's the common femoral artery. Here's the deep artery. Here's the common femoral vein and a branch off of it, one of the perforator vessels. You can see there's actually, you can see the clot in the common femoral vein, but that lateral perforator compresses beautifully and this clot is only partially occlusive of the common femoral vein. So this patient needs to be started on anticoagulation. Here's another femoral view. Quiz time, what do you think? The thing that's bouncing here is the artery. And this little circle up here, which collapses beautifully, is just a peripheral vessel. Deep vessels are always, pair, are always paired. And this femoral vein has a clot in it. So this is a positive DVT of this, common, of this femoral vein. It's not common now because it's moved down to the mid leg. Here's the common femoral vein. Here's a saphenous vein, and here's the femoral artery. You can see there's, you can actually see some echoes in here. Back to the beginning. Notice the saphenous is still here. Even when we squish it, the saphenous usually collapses really easily. So there must be a clot in here, otherwise it would have collapsed by now. And then this common femoral vein also has occlusive clot in it.
This is up in the femoral. That's what this says. It doesn't say moral. It says femoral. You just cut off femoral. So here is artery. Here's a vein. And at the beginning of the clip, you can see it collapses beautifully. And then all of a sudden, it stops collapsing. So this is a patient who has a negative and then a positive DVT ultrasound. We found their blood clot. Negative and then positive. Here's in the popliteal again. So this is the artery down here. Remember, in the pop, the veins on top, this artery's got thick walls, but the vessel above it is not collapsing. So this is a popliteal vein clot. Perfect. All right, that's the end of the resuscitation clips. If you haven't watched them yet, I hope you watch the other ones too. That's when we'll talk about renal and gallbladder, as well as some other miscellaneous findings of pregnancy and the eyeballs. See you then.